Thank you, Jeremy, for the keynote. Um, I'd like to take a brief moment to thank our amazing sponsors. Without their support, this security con would not be possible. So thank you to Red Hat, Sysdig, Optics, and VMware Tanzu for being our diamond sponsors. And also thank you to Apiro for being a platinum sponsor. With that, we are ready to begin the general sessions for the day. And first here, we have Mohan Atreya from Rafe Systems. Mohan will be talking about securing the Kubernetes infrastructure using Kubernetes Zero Trust principles. Mohan. Thank you. Um, am, I, am I audible? Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, great to see so many people here. Um, so I, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, a pretty interesting area. Uh, this, is, uh, this has been something that uh, we see a lot of users attempting now when it comes to Kubernetes. And uh, I, hope, I hope at the end of it, uh, you'll walk out with uh, some interesting insights. And uh, if you have some questions after the session, I'll be around. So just look me up and happy to chat more. <clears throat> so uh, what do we think we wanted to talk about this topic? Um, a lot of you here are very technical, um, but there's a vast majority of people out, 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 in the, out in the world who use Kubernetes a little differently. Um, if you've uh, seen some of the reports recently, like from Shadow Server, uh, there's nearly 380,000 Kubernetes clusters open on the internet. Think about that, open on the internet, right? Um, that's not good. Um, and uh, we kind of play in this space, so we've been kind of talking to people, why do you do this? And a lot of people say, it's just too hard if I have to go another way, go through a secure tunnel or something like that. So with this backdrop of why so many people are out there with open Kubernetes clusters on the internet, I mean, think about it. Your API server is the way by which you interact with your clusters, right, like uh, as a user. It's open on the internet. Anyone can touch it. Not good, right? So we ask people, what do you do um, it, typically, right? And then maybe there's a better approach. So what people are typically done, and this must be very familiar for you uh, if you've been in the, in the uh, industry for a while, uh, they put up a bastion. If you go to a security team, they probably will say, maybe you should use a bastion, right? Uh, Kubernetes is new to them. So what do they do? Um, they go set up a bastion. There's a, um, it, 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 you, know, you land up doing a, a a, a queue curl right from uh, the bastion onto your clusters in, in your VPC or something else. And now you have a problem. Uh, the problem is, well, there are two problems. First is, from that bastion, you can see everything in that VPC. All right? uh, if I'm an attacker, that's a juicy target. Right? And number two, me and my colleague getting onto the bastion using the same cube config, most likely. Right? So that's not good. Now you can't tell who did what. So this turns out to be a problem. OK way to start you land up having problems. The second thing that people do is they land up saying, well, this bastion thing is not working for me. Maybe I'll put up a jump host in front of it, right? I put up a jump host. Now, the user or the developer in this case is really, really ticked off because now you're asking the user to go through two jumps, right? Now, you may, you may start thinking here at this point in time, some you know, gears are probably churning in your head. You're thinking, how is this any different from VMs? We've done this for VMs for hundreds of years. Uh, why is it so painful? The problem is, in the old monolithic world, the, typically the only person doing this was the ops person. Right? In the Kubernetes world, it's every developer. When you have 100 microservices, the poor ops guy doesn't know which broke, what broke where. So many developers access right, to help out when you want to resolve issues, et cetera. So when you have hundreds of users attempting to do this, you're in a real, real painful situation, right? This is what people encounter in real life. The last thing that we see people do is they plonk a VPN in front. Um, not bad, right? Uh, except if you can afford it. Um, these VPNs do cost a lot of money. And if you have three, four data centers, I mean, it's game over from your budget perspective, right? You have so many VPN concentrators. Uh, but the good thing is now every user is using their own kubeconfig. And they're doing it right from the laptop. Um, uh, life is a little better, right? More secure. Uh, the, the primary thing is cost. Of course, this does not remove the attack surface problem, which means if I can VPN into my VPC, I see everything inside the VPC, right? Uh, allow me to. Not good.
Audible. Now we talked about how can I access stuff. Um, now let's talk about the second dimension. Actually, a very interesting aspect. If I'm accessing Kubernetes cluster, um, I ought to have some kind of operation. A developer have the same kind of access to administer. That's a known cluster wide privilege. Every developer came over. What people do? End up having, uh, for example, end up saying that, hey, all the developers of this application in Acme name have to be in the Acme namespace. Give them access only to Stop the orange line. That. You want to make sure that the developer um, uh, who doesn't need access to cluster wide privileges can only access things at the namespace. But if I'm an operations person, allow me cluster-wide privilege, because I need that. So you guys know this fundamental logic, this RBAC built into Kubernetes. You have to use it, the way by which you control your blast radius. Hello? Better? All right. Sorry, guys. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'll just go back to that previous slide for like two seconds. So the, the quick summary there is there's something called RBAC, or role-based access control in Kubernetes. Really important for you to understand that because you do not want every developer who does not need access to the entire cluster, um, you want to make sure you use RBAC so that they can only see what they want to see. Really, really important. So uh, now what happens at scale? Now you have one user or maybe one cluster, not a big problem. Right? You can do all of this manually. What we see customers struggle with and users struggle with is when you have tens or hundreds of clusters, and typically, like when I talk about microservices, when you have hundreds of microservices, you have hundreds of developers who constantly move from one team to another. Now your problem is magnified. You have hundreds of users, hundreds of developers, and you have many, many clusters. Now, how are you going to manage all these RBACs and even keep sense of them? Really hard, right? So you essentially, if you are looking into a model by which you are doing this manually, you are now in an impractical zone, right? It's just not possible to do this. So this is where um, uh, the processes fall apart, and you need some form of automation to make sure that the wrong people do not have access to the wrong things or the, uh, uh, more things than what they need. So um, now let's look, at, let's look at how can we solve this problem, both of these problems, in one fell swoop. Right? So let's look at this from maybe a requirements perspective. If I'm, a, if I'm an operations person and I have hundreds of developers that need to access stuff, and I need um, to support tens and hundreds of clusters running in data centers in many, many regions in Amazon, et cetera. The first thing I need to do is I cannot afford to put my clusters open on the internet. That's, I mean, everyone agrees to that. The next thing I need to do is make sure that I don't put my developers through this complicated Bastion or VPN-based user experience, which everyone hates, right? None of us like that experience. So what you re need, really need is to leverage what's been out in the market for tens of years. I mean, if, if, if folks uh, have heard about companies like Zscaler and all these companies, they've been like very pervasive, they all do this. But for web applications, why not for kubectl? Why not for Cube API? It, after all, runs on HTTPS, right? So the first thing you need is a way by which you can access these clusters, even though the clusters are cloaked behind a firewall. Can you do that? Yeah, if you can do that with Zscaler, why not? The next thing you want to do is you don't want these RBAC to be permanently injected inside the cluster. You want to do that dynamically, just in time. Why is that really important? You don't want credentials to be permanently sitting on clusters. right? You want to remove them after the session is complete. So the automated ephemeral RBAC, really important. All user access need to be strongly authenticated, given, right? And then finally, this is a question that people struggle with from a governance and compliance. If I come and ask you, hey, what are the kubectl commands that ran against my cluster 
or rather, Johnny ran some commands yesterday. What did he run? People have no idea, right? There's no way to reconstruct that. What if there was, right? So these are the four things we see that organizations need to have a sensible practice around making sure that you run things at scale with your clusters, where you open up access to your developers, give them a fantastic experience, and, and make sure that you're not running insecure. So, um, so what are we going to talk about now? I'm going to, for the remaining part of the session, I'm going to do two things. I'm going to talk about an open source project that, that, uh, um, that we announced some time back called Parallels. Um, it's actually based on something we noticed about three years ago in the market. You know, about three years ago, you know, we all started working from home uh, because of uh, the, the pandemic, right? And we had coincidentally introduced a zero trust access uh, capability in our platform, and uh, that took off like a rocket ship. The, I mean, I don't have the charts here to show, but you know, it was almost like you know a curve like that. And it's because people are working from home. Everyone hated VPNs. Nobody wanted bastions, and everyone wanted instant access to the clusters. So you're going to see that in action with this open source offering. We open sourced it because we felt that it's really important for the industry to kind of move a couple of notches up from a security perspective, right? Like everybody should be able to do this. You should not be requiring a commercial offering to do this. So let's let's talk a little bit about Parallels. It's open source, Apache license, so you can pull it down and use it, right? And if you are using something like DigitalOcean, you have a one-click experience. Just go there, search for Parallels, click it, install it, use it. Please participate in the community, right? Like we would love to see how we can improve this. We love to have contributors. I mean, like you guys are all, you know, pretty aware of how the community is so important to make sure this these projects are successful. So help us out. Let's make the industry more secure. Um, uh, try and participate in this project. So how does this work? Now you kind of heard about the zero trust. Let me kind of show you architecturally. Then I'll show you a live demo. I'm sure it'll blow your mind, right? So the first thing you have is you have the access manager, Parallels access manager. This is a proxy. It's a kubectl proxy or a kube API proxy on the internet, right? It's got these, um, an agent running on every one of your clusters. And notice the arrow is out, outbound, right? So the agent dials out on port 443 from your clusters behind firewalls to the Parallels access manager and runs a long running control plane session, right? It's, a, it's essentially keeping it alive, the connection. Now, when the developer who is sitting at home can access the Parallels access server, they don't know any different. They get a kube config, they say kubectl get namespace or something like that, right? They don't know if they're touching Parallels or the end cluster. They don't need to know. They're hitting the proxy, right? Uh, and the proxy authenticates them. It's a two-way authentication. With digital certificates, it's very strongly authenticated. Of course, everything is encrypted. It's HTTPS, right? And not only that, anything the user types is now audited, right? So if I type some funky commands, you can reconstruct the whole set of commands. And from a compliance and governance perspective, this is really important. Right? And once that authentication is complete, it's just basically on the wire. The commands are flying back and forth between the client and the server. Now, before that, the downstream API server at this time has no idea who you are. It has no RBAC for you on that cluster. So remember, at step two, when the user authenticated with the Parallels Access Manager, they're also indicating you want to access the cluster on the top. An RBAC is generated on the fly, and a service account is injected into that cluster. Right? This is all happening in milliseconds, right? Milliseconds or microseconds, right? So the API server is the one that's actually controlling everything behind the scenes. Parallels here is nothing more than the main gatekeeper. It's just an access proxy. That's pretty much it. It's access proxy authenticating you, generating the RBAC, injecting the service account on that cluster. Sounds fascinating, right? 
I'm sure you guys want to see a very quick demo of that. I'll, I'll, I'll do that right now, right? Um, so let's see that. So what, what you're going to see here is uh, um, I have the Parallels Access Manager set up. It's running in New York in DigitalOcean. Right, uh, I'm now here in, in Detroit, and hopefully my internet will work, and uh, uh, you'll see me attempt to run a kubectl command, and I can run this against three clusters. What I've done is, like, I've simulated a typical environment any small company would have, a dev environment, a staging cluster, a production cluster, right? And what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna show you if I log in as an ops person, I can see everything, because that's what my access rules are. And I'll have cluster-wide privileges. But if I log in as a developer, I will not have access to production, because that's the rule I've set up here. Right? Now, this should be like easy, right? Like, how do you do that? Um, uh, uh, why not see it in action? So let me um, very quickly. It's going to be complicated because I'm holding the mic and doing this at the same time. So this is a Parallels Access Server. So what you're seeing here are three projects. I have a dev project, a prod project, and a staging project. Inside that, I have a cluster, a dev cluster. And if I want a kubectl to it, I mean, I don't know where it's running. I don't need to know. And I can say, hey, get namespace, and uh, I get the thing. Now, the key thing here, uh, uh, you know, you don't even see the the service account being dynamically injected on the cluster. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip to another cluster, um, just for kicks, and uh, I'm going to show you live. Let's go inspect the service account. So when I run this, um, let me type this out. I can't talk and type at the same time. Yeah. It's also autocomplete, thank God. So when you go look at that, um, if you look at this service account for this user, it was generated about two hours ago when I was just practicing and rehearsing for this demo. Now what I'll do is I'll log in as an ops person and we'll see this being generated live, right? So what I'm gonna do now is gonna log in as an ops person. I'm gonna authenticate as John, right? And if you look at John, the, the company, the central access manager said, John has access, because he belongs to the ops group, I have access to the dev, prod, and staging. This mapping is done automatically based on my group membership, right? Then I go into prod, and I'll do the same thing. Uh, and uh, I'm hitting the same cluster, and if I look for the same thing, which is a get service account, minus n, parallel system, you'll see that ops John, this email, just 10 seconds ago, the service account was dynamically created on that cluster, right? Just 10 seconds ago, and when I log out, that service account will be flushed, which means nobody has keys to the kingdom all the time. Every time I access, I need to authenticate. Really important, so tomorrow I change my role. Today they move me from ops to dev. I will not have this level of access anymore. Everything is automatic. Right? So that level of federation really important. Now let's log in as the dev. Right? So I'm going to log in as Sally. Sally is a dev in this uh, company. And when Sally logs in, remember Sally, um, because she belongs to the developer group, the company had decided Sally and developers don't have access to um, the production environment. So as you can see here, there's only dev and staging clusters visible. Now, Sally also belongs to only one namespace called Apple, right? There's a namespace called Apple on the cluster. She only has access to that. Let's see if Sally attempts something smart and uh, attempts to see anything more what happens. But before that, let's see. You know, if I'm just going to try typing in, um, you know, uh, I'm listing all my pods in my Apple namespace. Everything looks good. Now, Sally says, you know what? I really am curious. I want to see who else is running what on this cluster. And I type a get namespace. And you notice access is forbidden. 
Why is this forbidden? Because the RBAC for Sally that was injected under that cluster is constrained down to the Apple namespace. She can only see the Apple namespace, nothing more. Right? Imagine doing this for hundreds of developers who are constantly moving from group to group or hundreds of operations people. Everything is automatic. Right? You add people to the right group, RBAC follows them. Right? That's the power of Parallels for you. So um, the last thing I want to show you here is, is the audit trail. So if you remember, as a user, I was typing a bunch of things. As a company, if I'm an auditor, I can go in and look at every command that was run by whether I was a Sally here or John here or the admin here, whatever I did, everything can be tracked. Right? So from a governance perspective, people can rewind back and say, this person did this, these are the sequence of commands. What I see users tell me now on forums is fascinating. We initially built this assuming they will use it for security purposes. What people are saying is they're using this to automate runbooks now. Like, you know, there's this really sharp engineer who knows how to run the kubectl commands in a certain sequence. They capture that and say, I'm going to bottle this up, and I'm going to use, have other people follow the same sequence of commands. So very fascinating set of feedback from organizations. So in summary, we encourage everyone in the industry to do three things, at least three things. Please do not put your Kubernetes clusters on the internet. Cloak them. Make sure that people have zero trust access. Make sure your developers get access to your clusters from anywhere with the right RBAC. Make sure the RBAC injection, the service account injection is done dynamically, which means only right level of access is given at the right time. And make sure you have an audit trail of everything. Right. This, this, in summary, would get you to a point where you're running secure operations for your Kubernetes environments. I think that's all I had. If there are any questions, I'll be around at the back or outside. Um, I'll also be at the booth, Rafi booth, later this week. It's just stop by. I think we'll have something about Parallels there. Thank you. Uh, do we have time for Go ahead. Uh, yeah. We have the mic. So what is the current stat state or status of Parallels? Can it be used in production? And, yes. and second question is the performance hit. Like what kind of performance hits are we looking? Yeah, yeah. very good questions. So two questions there. Um, what's the stage of the project? Um, as you all know, at CNCF, there's a, there's a pecking order, right? You eventually want to get to a graduated stage. We are now in sandbox, right? We are submitted for sandbox. So we really have been looking for the community to kind of help us. You know, we need the right kind of sponsorship from the community to move up the ladder, right? So help us out there. Uh, we're right now in sandbox, uh, getting into sandbox, application for sandbox. We had, to, we had to climb up that ladder, right? It takes sometimes years to climb up. So that's the first question. The second question is, what's a performance hit? So um, there's typically a, about a, I mean, you saw the whole thing in action, right? Me typing in the command as a user is imperceptible, but you can measure it. It's typically in milliseconds. It's in milliseconds for the first time when the user is authenticated and the service account is injected on the downstream cluster. That's about a millisecond needed that is to just orchestrate that. But typically, the user never notices anything. Uh, by the time you think about the command you're going to type, it's all done. Right? So, uh, and uh, you can run these proxies anywhere in the world. So what we see organizations do is say, hey, I'm going to run my parallel access server closer to my clusters. Because it really comes down to distance. You can't beat the laws of physics. Right? So if you run the parallel access server closer to your clusters, or closer to your users. I think that's the decision you got to make. Yeah, yes. Um, so am I right in thinking that Parallels proxy node has to have admin creds to all clusters so that it can dynamically generate the RBAC? And if so, mm. is there any roadmap in how to uh, third-party pen test of the, the public facing node? Yes, good question. I'll repeat it because I'm sure others couldn't hear. Um, 
So the, there are two fold questions. One is, uh, does the Parallels Access Manager need cluster-wide privileges um, to do its job? And number two is, is there a plan to do a third-party pen test? The answer is yes to both. Um, the the third-party pen test kind of happens naturally as part of the CNCF process. Every project is put through a microscope, right? Um, as it happens, I think that's why we encourage every project to go through the CNCF, uh, you know, governance model. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, reach out to us on Slack. We're pretty active on Slack. Um, uh, I think I just look for parallels. I'm sure you'll find it. Thank you.